We're going to give it just a minute for everybody to come into the room and get started before we jump into our introductions here. But welcome everybody to our webinar. I love it. I love it. Okay, so as the participants are rolling in, um, I'm going to go ahead and jump into the introduction to the webinar. So welcome to our webinar about how and when to start LGBTQIA plus and allies employee resource groups. My name is MJ Mauer and my pronouns are she, her and hers. I'm a partnerships manager and co-lead and co-founder of All Pride here at All Voices. This webinar is hosted by All Voices, and for folks who aren't familiar, All Voices is an employee intelligence platform meant to systematically ask for, analyze, and act on feedback of all kinds. You'll find good ideas and bad habits in real time and reduce turnover and recruiting costs. So with that being said, let's jump into introductions of our amazing panelists. So panelists, please introduce yourself, including your pronouns, your role at um, your role and the work that you do at your company. So I'm going to go ahead and start with Anne. Hi everyone, um, my name is Anne. My pronouns are they them. I am a vice president uh, in the consumer and community bank at J.P. Morgan in inclusion. I work building out inclusion-oriented talent capability models for the 130,000 people that work within that segment of the business. And I was formerly at Peloton where I built and ran our LGBTQ plus employee resource group for several years. Um, and I'm based in New York in Brooklyn, best place in the world. So I'm glad to be here. Happy Pride. Happy Pride. Okay, Stephanie, introduce yourself as well. Hi there, uh, my name is Stephanie Kupke. Uh, my pronouns are she, her. Um, I am, I work for an organization, um, a family of organizations actually, uh, New Residential Mortgage, Caliber Home Loans and Shell Point Mortgage. Uh, my current role is as the um, Senior Vice President of Strategy and Project Management for uh, the servicing organization um, and as uh, Chair of our Pride organization. Awesome, Greg? Happy to be here. Happy Pride, everyone. Hey, everyone. I'm Greg Erickson. I'm manager of People Insights at 3Q Debt. Uh, I actually go by any pronouns, so whatever's fine. Um, and so I do all of our HR analytics and organizational psychology work at 3Q Debt. And on top of that, because we're an organization of about 500 people, we all wear a lot of hats on the HR and people team. So I do a lot of diversity and inclusion work. Um, one of the things that I do as well is I help start our ERG program, um, which now has six employee research groups. And rather than start an LGBTQ plus ERG, I was actually the liaison between our two wonderful chairs who do incredible work and our executive sponsor, making sure that they got the ERG off to a strong start and then support them along the way. I love it. Happy to have you here. And last but not least, Gwen. Hi, I'm Gwen. Uh, my pronouns are she, her. I am a senior risk analyst at Chime. That means I use big data statistics and coding to fight the bad guys in, in the internet world. Uh, I am also a co-founder, one of the co-founders of OutChime, LGBT ERG at Chime. I'm currently the business partnership leads, which means I do product development for the ERGs in Chime. Um, currently, I'm the head of preferred names at Chime, which is a broad initiative to enable our members to use their preferred names in our app uh, across the board. So happy to be here. That's awesome. And such an important initiative. I'm really excited about that. Um, okay, let's jump in here. Uh, starting with the first question, how did you start your ERG? You know, what was the first step? And, and what did that process look like at a high level? And I'm gonna, I'm gonna start with you on that one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so when I started at Peloton, actually our people team was fewer than five people. Um, we were a startup at the time and our kind of global head of brand marketing became our interim head of DEI and she really couldn't do both jobs, you know, like those are two big jobs. So she was looking for volunteers to help her stand up some of the parts of our inclusion strategy and 
I had come from a super queer environment to Peloton and I was looking to both build community and also make Peloton the best place to work for LGBTQ plus folks. So I joined her to start our ERG program and founding our first ever employee resource group at the company Peloton Cry and Allies. Um, and, you know, it, it took the form of really just having small meetings to begin with, with LGBTQ plus folks who were interested in being at the forefront of developing the mission and values that would center our ERG going forward. Um, and so I started having some smaller lunches where we worked first to build out that mission and values that would ground all of our work going forward. Um, and over time, you know, it grew from like 15 people getting lunch in New York to several hundred people in the US and internationally, which was really cool, but it took several years uh, to get there. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing. Actually, I think that's a really great first step to take if you're thinking about starting an, EG, an ERG is just start having some of those conversations, asking some of those questions, figuring out what are the questions that we should be asking as we're thinking about starting this ERG. Uh, Gwen, I want to pass that same question to you. You know, how did you get started? What was the first step? And what did that process really look like at a high level? So I, I've I actually started a couple different ERGs. <laughs> One was back at Stripe when it was a much different company and the company dictated they wanted an ERG. So I, I started it and it was the one who was just there in the moment. Uh, but when I came to Chime, it, it was, I was very open about the fact that, you know, I was very interested in CRG, ERG work. We called it CRG Chime or resource groups. Um, but I was very vocal. I was very loud about that. And there were other people who were also very interested in that. Uh, we were a very small company at the time. We were probably 50, 60 people. Uh, but especially at that sort of time, it was really easy to get access to people like the executives and say like, hey, this is something we should do. There's a lot of value to that. And over time, just that being loud, that repetitious, this is something we should do. This is the right thing to do, uh, kind of wore them down to the point where, you know, I think I was there five, six months before they were like, all right, you know, we're on board if this is something you want to do. Uh, go ahead and do whatever you want. And they kind of just opened the door and let me do whatever I wanted. And we built it from the ground up mission charter. And now we've been running three, four years with just broad support from the company. And it's been great, but it, it all really started very small from the like, can we, can we, can we, and just trying to get in front of people's faces. And, and from there, we took it and just took every inch they gave us and ran. I love that. Be loud and persistent and, and take every, take every inch you can and run with it. Um, Greg, you have a bit of a different perspective, especially kind of acting in that liaison role as you're thinking, you know, what do you think about whenever you think about what are those first steps? What does that process look like at a high level when you're thinking about starting an ERG? Yeah, definitely love to answer this. So the interesting thing at 3Q is we had been talking about employee resource groups in our, you know, diversity and inclusion Slack channel for a very long time with people kind of uh, you know, weighing the pros and cons of like, are we big enough where we want to divide ourselves up into smaller groups or should we stay kind of centralized? And then as that conversation developed over uh, several years, we realized that, you know, it's, it's getting to that time where we really need to, to create our employee resource group. So that gave us a lot of time to prepare and really have a strong foundation for how we wanted to launch our employee resource groups. So we launched four at a time. And the main thing that we wanted to do is front load a lot of the work. So our ERG chairs were expected to come up and uh, with a lot of content around their employee resource groups. Uh, some of the more notable things that I think really helped is uh, they were expected to create 12 months of content because it's really tough when you have just finished you know, your, your content for one month and then the, the next month is coming up and you already have a job to do. And so creating that content ahead of time or at least an outline really allowed our ERG chairs to to have less of a burden and, and less of a scramble each month. Um, we also had them really focus on uh, attraction and retention plans. So how are they gonna provide uh, value to our employees and their members? And how are they going to be continuously thinking about how they're going to pull in members? Because one of the toughest things is maintaining high membership numbers. And I think a lot of ERG chairs don't really realize that when they set out. And so by making them consciously think about how they were going to be pulling in members, not just at the start, but throughout the year, really got them in that mindset of continuously kind of pulling people in. 
Um, I think also a really great one to, to start out with is make sure that the executive sponsor for the employee resource group is in the process fairly early on and can put you know, their experience and what they want to accomplish into the uh, charter as it's being created. So they, we have the executive sponsor review the charter, make adjustments, talk to the chairs about what they'd like to see, because what's so important there is the executive sponsor then feels like a true owner of the ERG and is in it for the long haul. We've seen all of our executive sponsors, they've been with the ERGs from the start, they don't have any interest in leaving and they're very active in all of our ERGs, especially our LGBTQ plus ERG. And so it's really cool to see them feel a lot of attraction and connection with the ERG and a lot of ownership. Absolutely. I just want to mention that I just love that Greg said um, is like from an organizational perspective, you want to make sure there's a super clear definition of the roles and responsibilities of employee resource group leads, because I think one of the biggest challenges in organizations with employee resource groups is do they work on the product? Do they work on recruiting? Are they just in an employee experience oriented role? Um, what are their responsibilities? Because once you give an employee resource group leader ownership of something, it's difficult to take that away. And it doesn't feel good to this person who is doing so much to create an environment, an inclusive environment at your company, doing so much like free potentially labor for you. So defining strictly those roles and responsibilities is a great way to be set up for success and making your employee resource groups fe leaders feel good in their position and that they can truly own that. I love that. That is so very, very true. Those clear definitions can be really a really strong way to set that up for success. Um, I want to shift the conversation over to you, Stephanie, a little bit. And I want to hear a little bit about your prou proudest moment. You know, over the last year, what are some of those accomplishments or these, you know, your proudest moments when it comes to your ERG? Um, sure. We've had we've had a, a lot um, of them actually, and um, it's it's been an interesting um, two and a half years probably that we've been at an active ERG. We went through um, a merger in the middle of that, so we're actually a new active ERG all at the same time. Um, but through this, I'll tell you a couple of um, of things that have been really impactful. One is. I think a little bit differently, obviously, in the LGBTQ community is that not we're not always front facing, meaning somebody that we don't wear a tattoo on our head that says we identify as something. Um, we don't have, you know, necessarily skin of a specific color that identifies us as, a, you know, there's no rainbow on me at all when I walk into a room. And so um, I think the biggest impact has just been that we have more and more out people at work. Um, I've always been out. I don't know anything differently. Um, it's mostly because I'm loud and obnoxious and um, my truth is my truth. And that just is what it is. And I, I tried to fake it at one moment um, and use the word partner uh, when I first was hired at this organization. And I literally messed it up the very first conversation while in my head saying, I'm going to, I'm going to do this because I don't know if it's safe yet. Right. Um, so I've just been who I am this entire time, but I realized around me that others weren't and they weren't even truthful and authentic to me. And not because obviously not because anybody's lying to me, but because of a safety concern. Right. And so, um, I think my proudest moment is that right now on my board is comprised of 100% um, LGBTQ identifying individuals, which a year ago was not the case. Um, and I thank the allies and I appreciate allies and I understand that we can't be in a safe space without allies, but the voices need to be that of the LGBTQ plus community. And so knowing that we have um, lesbian, bisexual, transgender and gay identifying individuals on the board um, is, ex it is an extremely powerful thing um, for our organization. So I'd say that that's one of the largest um, successes that I feel like we've had. Um, and the other pieces, I think, um, differently than any of the other ERGs in my organization is that we're actually making, um, create, helping you know, work with HR to create new policies, um, to create better policies, to create uh, playbooks for indiv individuals and managers, dealing with individuals who are transitioning, uh, working on um, evaluating benefits to make sure that they're fully inclusive. And we've made, um, you know, we've made some pretty good strides and we hope to continue through our open enrollment this year, making additional strides. So I'd say that um, it's, a, it's a powerful thing to have an ERG like this at, the, at any organization. I love that. Uh, thank you so much for sharing. I love those, 
uh, accomplishments. And that really is so powerful to have that kind of representation as well. Um, I got a question in the chat here that also kind of leans into a question I was hoping to ask you, Gwen, as well. But it says, you know, what kind of support and participation would you have liked from your HR team when starting up an ERG at your organization? So Gwen, I know that you have founded a variety of ERGs in your career. What do you wish that these companies would lean into to understand how to make that process smoother and easier and more efficient and provide that support that we're looking for? So I've been lucky in having fairly supportive HR teams. Uh, you know, that I've never really had that explicit, no, you can't do this, or at least no, you can't have, you can't create an ERG because the the concept of ERGs has always been broadly accepted where I, I've gone to the point where if it hasn't existed, it's been a very short matter of time before one was created. Uh, but I, I have faced some resistance from HR after the creation of, of these ERGs and trying to push for some of the, the things we want, like compensation or being involved in certain aspects of the, the product and stuff like that. And you know, it, it's really tricky because you have to have a little bit of give and take, you know, you want the world, you want this really excellent thing that's going to do all this good. But in the real world, you know, they have their priorities, they have their own resources, which they have to allocate. And, you know, they do have their own things they have to take into consideration that might be in conflict with what you're trying to accomplish. So be flexible, but at the same time, you know, like, push them. Um, I, I find most people tend to be very helpful and supportive if you give them a chance to be. Uh, but just, you know, give them a chance. <laughs> I, I'm sorry if I'm not being terribly helpful here. I, I, I haven't had that experience of having really combative HR teams. Yeah, I think that's super helpful. Stephanie, did you have something you wanted to add to that? Yeah, I was going to add that. Um, I actually think HR's role in the ERGs is um, necessary um, for them to be vocal partners in this. Um, from my experience within our organization, it's just been our ERGs just lip service, right? Are they just a smokescreen for inclusivity? Are they just the rainbow during June, just to say that we have a rainbow during June, right? Um, and I think having vocal, so we have a DE&I team within HR and they orchestrate things at a corporate level. Um, they don't they, they help, you know, maybe um, create some consistency around charters. They come out with, and they're starting to publish a newsletter that gives little snippets about all of the ERGs, just to give one more set of visibility and things like that. But what they really do is they bring us all together on a monthly basis. We talk about the events going on. We have open conversation between the board members of each of the ERGs, and they help facilitate that. And if we have issues, they take it back to the executives and help do that on our behalves, and they create some consistency around how each of the ERGs are functioning. Um, which gives more clout to the ERGs in that this is a corporate, this is a company thing and employee, you know, for the employees. Um, the bottom line is inclusivity bring, you know, generates productivity for any organization. So if they're not wanting to do that, they're silly if you ask me. Um, but I think just having both sides of the fence, the employee driven ERG and the corporate driven DE&I initiatives and having those overlap and having partnerships in things like the corporate equality index surveys and, and other such resources that are out there, I think it's important to the success of the employees um, for the organization, in my opinion. I love that. I think that's a great way to add to that as well. That support is really important as well. Um, I do want to take this opportunity as well to make sure that we take a minute to lean into the conversation of intersectionality as well. You know, no group is a monolith and we know that intersectionality is important. Some companies have additional ERGs uh, you know, ERGs for Black folks or women or other groups. So how do your companies, how do you work with other ERGs in your organization? Greg, I think, especially with your current position, you're a good person to kind of start with answering that question. Yeah, I'd love to handle some of this. So uh, I think the first thing uh, is a lot of it happens very naturally if you have a lot of opportunities for ERG chairs to collaborate and build connections. So we have a, a Slack channel where we have the ERG success team um, and we have all of the chairs and some other people who kind of interact with the, the chairs 
And that, that channel is just to post questions, you know, how do you reach out to speakers? Uh, do you have any things that, or any events that have gone really well? And really create those, those opportunities for people to share what's going well, what's not going well, so that people feel comfortable reaching out to the other ERGs and starting up events. We also have quarterly meetings where our ERG chairs talk about what went well, what didn't go well, where they need a little bit of help. And that also kind of helps people build connections. And then from there, I think an easy win is if there's like a month or a day that's dedicated to one of the communities. Oftentimes our ERG chairs get really excited about doing some kind of cross collaboration with them. So for example, our LGBTQ plus ERG, uh, they did a, a panel on the experience of trans women in the workplace or for uh, in collaboration with our parent employee resource group, they did how to raise children as allies. And so uh, a lot of our ERGs often set up this uh, goal of one collaborative meeting with another ERG or for each one of the other ERGs, they'll set up at least one cross collaboration a year, which I think is really, really cool. And a lot of that isn't something that we mandated. It's just because they really want to work with the other chairs because we really built connections between everybody. I love that. And I love the value of building those connections and allowing the different ERGs to lean into that intersectionality themselves as well. Um, Stephanie, I want to push that question to you too. You know, how are, how do you work with some other ERGs at your organization? Um, you know, I think it's important, um, and I've mentioned it a couple of times, that we, we have monthly meetings driven by our HR team, which just provides an opportunity for all of us to listen and hear things and give each other advice on, hey, we just did this event, and it sounds very similar to what you're doing. Here's some things that you know were successful or versus not. But at a bigger level, we specifically look for ways that our messages um, intersect. And um, so specifically, I can come up with two examples. Um, one was Mental Health Awareness uh, Month. And obviously, that actually applies to any person as a human being. Um, but we partnered with our women's leadership team for that, as there are some sp very specific needs to um, LGBTQ plus employees and women. Um, and there's a lot of intersectionality there. Uh, the other piece is uh, planned for later in the year when it comes to transgender awareness. Um, in November. And, you know, the community that can often be the most um, <clears throat> discriminated against, even within a, a discriminated against um, um, uh, time frame or, or, excuse me, group is um, people of color that intersect with the transgender community. So, uh, so we will be partnering with our uh, people of color um, ERG later in the year to make sure that that message gets out in, in a joint way. And I think there's just a lot of messages like that that are that are beneficial. But just like this forum here, it provides us opportunities to learn and grow uh, together and to develop best practices and to create some consistency and to not step on toes and to have joint membership fairs and to update our um, new hire orientation collectively with all of the ERGs in there to introduce people. So it just provides a lot of opportunity to um, to to expand your message, to selfishly give, you know, put my message in more places. Um, and, and so, you know, I think there's a ton of benefit to that. Absolutely. It sounds like that also is going to help drive some of that membership that we know we need to keep up and, and keep focused on as ERG leaders. When you're all working together and working collaboratively, you're often not just a member of one single ERG. You know, we find employees that want to be active in multiple places and you can communicate and collaborate together to create some, some of those really valuable membership opportunities, as well as like learning opportunities, which are particularly important as well. Yeah, MJ, that's a great point. We, I send a, an email out to my Pride um, members for any event that's happening in another ERG and encourage them to show up. And I show up myself on video so they see my face. Uh, so I'm representing not only my ERG, but you know, it really leveraging that to entice others to do the same. I love that. I think that is so, so super important. We've gotten a couple of additional questions in the chat and in the Q&A here around allies and, and accomplices. So, you know, Anne, I think I want to start with you on this. You know, what role do allies and accomplices have in ERGs to you? I mean, they have a huge role. That's absolutely for sure. And simultaneously, it's important for there to be spaces where folks with shared experiences can speak to each other. So I think those two things exist at once and it's really important to understand that. So 
at Peloton, what we did was we created both of those spaces. We created a group that was for everyone, and we created a group that was only for LGBTQ plus folks, and we created a group that was only for trans and gender non-conforming folks. And I found that that was really helpful in order to create safe spaces for people to have conversations they wouldn't necessarily want to have around people they didn't share that experience with especially within the trans community, because there are a lot of very personal conversations involved around medical care, around uh, how you formerly were referred to, around your body and other things that wouldn't necessarily, you wouldn't necessarily feel comfortable talking to other folks about who didn't understand what you were going through. But, you know, allies are going to be the biggest group, no matter what. And in order to push forward any agenda and make it make any company the best place to work for LGBTQ plus folks or black folks or Latinx folks, you need people who don't identify that way, pushing forward the message, acting as advocates, speaking out and having the courage to speak out when someone is harassed or discriminated against for their identity. Um, you need to be, you need to have the humility to, you know, admit that you don't know everything and and allyship is incredibly important. And a lot of our events, you know, they're focused on allies um, or they were focused on allies because they were educational. And if you're a member of the LGBTQ plus community, of course, there are experiences that you don't share, like maybe the transgender experience, but, um, you know, they were, they were really focused on bringing people in who didn't share that experience and empowering them to take that into their communities, their teams um, and act on them. So like, um, folks like Stephanie and others were saying um, inter ERG events are really, really important for that particular purpose, because if you're crossing ERGs, yes, you're you are reaching people with intersectional identities and bringing them in, but you're also bringing in folks from, you know, who are parents, but who aren't LGBTQ, but might be might raise an LGBTQ child to that space and empowering them to be excellent parents to whatever kid they raise. Um, and so, I mean, I think it's important to create spaces for allies and it's important for to create spaces for people who simply identify as the one thing. Um, and allies out there, I've, I've been seeing some questions in the group about like, oh, should I even be part of this ERG? You should be part of the ERG, but you should also continuously interrogate whether you know you are like being respectful in your place and make sure to ask questions and continuously learn and don't just be there as an interloper or and ask yourself whether you are there to kind of look at other people's experiences and kind of like like I don't know be a voyeur of them or if you're there to really try to understand the experience of others and use that in order to be an advocate um, for those people in your community who are more, more vulnerable than you. Absolutely. Along those same lines, uh, there's a few people asking in the chat about questions uh, around providing training for how to be an effective ally. So I want to kind of open that up to the whole group here. Um, do you have any experience around providing training or having conversations either at the beginning of your ERG meetings or during them about what does it truly look like to be an effective ally? And how can we encourage that conversation instead of inviting people into the room who may talk over or may miss the point of some of the conversations that we're having? I mean, I can talk about a training that I ran. Um, yeah. I did a lot of inclusive language trainings, which are incredibly important for the LGBTQ plus community because, you know, being referred as you want to be referred as is one of the biggest ways you can bring someone self-esteem um, and show your respect to them. So um, at Peloton, one of our largest member facing groups of people is our instructors. They speak to tens of millions of people a day giving it workout classes. So if their language isn't inclusive, if they're not referring to members as they want to be referred to, then you're alienating customers, not only people within your organization, but people who are paying for your product. Um, so I did 
inclusive language trainings to help our instructors speak inclusively to and about members in their classes and in the studio, um, which led to a lot of cool changes within the instructor language, including one of our head instructors starting to use the phrase kings, queens, and non-binary royalty, which I thought was cute and nice. Um, but also, eventually, um, we added non-binary gender options to our profiles for our users to for further enable folks to identify as they wanted to on the platform and to enable our instructors to use that inclusive language for them. I love that. That's a great training. And I think rather than, you know, I think it can be super helpful to have specific trainings, but it also is a conversation that you have almost constantly. Like you said, a lot of these meetings and events that we're having are geared towards allies. So it's a conversation that you have in all of these educational moments that you have with the allies in your ERGs about how to continue to be a really good ally. Um, uh, I also want to go ahead and talk about that, you know, allies and accomplices role. And, and um, Greg, I want to ask you that question too. What role do these allies and accomplices have in, in ERGs at, at 3Q Dev? Yeah, um, when I'm thinking of the LGBTQ plus ERGs, um, I think one of the important things to remember when we're thinking about allies and accomplices is that the uh, community isn't really a monolith. So in some sense, every person in this group is an ally to other people within the group. So they, in some sense, don't play any role that's any different from anybody else who's in there and can really kind of look around as to how everybody's behaving, um, you know, when, you know, maybe it's a gay person supporting the trans community or vice versa, you know, in, in any of those directions. And so I think with that mindset, you can kind of really think about things in a little bit healthier of a perspective. So it's, it's a little bit of a short answer, but something I wanted to mention there for sure. Absolutely, absolutely. We have um, a couple of questions popping in about this. I think you can't really have an, an ERG panel without having a conversation around compensation. Uh, you know, are your leaders compensated? What does that look like? How are you recognized, celebrated and compensated as ERG leaders? Uh, Gwen, I want to start with you on that one. Ooh, this is a tricky topic. Um, yes. I have been said no to several times when asking for compensation for ERGs. It's a, a very ongoing thing. Uh, but at the current state, yes, I am compensated fiscally for my work. Uh, as an ERG leader, I am paid for that work. Um, that was not always the case, and that's something that took a lot of effort to get to. Uh, like I said, I've been said no to about that exact topic many times. Um, but at, at Chime, all of our CRG leaders do receive actual payment for their services. And this is something that was a process over many years. You know, we, we initially approached uh, the company with this idea when we were just starting ERGs. They were allocating budgets for our, our CRGs. And we essentially came to them with the argument that like, hey, you're clearly putting a financial number behind these ERGs. There are people putting their time, their work behind this. We should likewise be putting a financial uh, number to that sort of thing. And really trying to make the argument that like the money is already flowing out the door. So why not direct it to the people actually doing the work uh, rather than just throwing it at t-shirts for everybody at the company? Um, I mean, we all love t-shirts, but like still you got to actually pay the people doing the work. Uh, but, Absolutely. <laughs> so yeah, so when I first pushed for that at Stripe got told no, and, and I think Stripe still actually doesn't do that. Chime, when I first pushed for that, got told no. And then I actually kind of stopped talking about it for about a year because I, I got a, like a really definitive no about it, circled off of leadership and then just came through like doing something a year later. And they're like, oh yeah, Gwen, by the way, you're going to get start, you're, you're going to get paid for this now. And apparently they, they had heard us the first time. And even though they had said no, it had planted that seed in their mind of like, you know what, this actually is fair. And the, the logic they're, they're saying, you know, we're paying for these CRGs, we're paying a budget. It makes sense. And ultimately letting it sit and a couple other people chipped away at it a little bit more. Uh, but eventually they did come to that realization that, yeah, you know, we should be paying these people for their work. And, you know, now I am paid for my work. And that's something I, I'm very happy to say. And I think everybody in CRG work, at least the leaders should be paid for the work. And um, it's a really important thing I think we need to talk about more. Absolutely. Gary, I see you nodding along. I know this is something you're super passionate about. Uh, give us your take as well. Yeah. And Gwen, I love the way that you, you framed that with the money's already flowing out the door. So why not direct it you know, to the people doing the work? 
Um, but yeah, this was a conversation that we had at 3Q for sure. So we give about 1K to, not about exactly 1K to each ERG chair group. So if it's one chair, they get the whole thing. If not, they split it into 500 each. Um, but before we even broach this conversation, we tactically set it up following a town hall where we discussed the concept of members of marginalized community having to do their own job while battling uphill, you know, with systemic biases. And then also there's this expectation that they consult for free to the organization around diversity and inclusion. And so that really educated all of the stakeholders before we even had this conversation. And then there was a couple key things that we talked about along the way that really helped. So I've actually seen the light switch kind of flip from this one idea in general, but these ERGs can, if you have compensation, then it's a lot easier, like Anne mentioned, to have a list of responsibilities and expectations. And one of the key things is to have them work as internal consultants. And so we had a night and day difference between two projects where we had a very large client asking one of our uh, teams to make a targeted marketing campaign to, uh, and the team who was supposed to do the work had nobody in that community within their team. And they felt extremely uncomfortable trying to create a marketing campaign uh, for that. And even if they had like a, a team member, you know, one person from that group still, I don't think that that would have truly solved the challenge. But after the formation of our employee resource group, and now um, we have this expectation that the ERGs will come and do some consulting. So we had a large client asked to run a story centered around um, a non-binary individual and the story of them coming out. And so our uh, LGBTQ plus ERG had a wonderful time, you know, working with them, uh, reviewing the story, sharing ideas on what can make an improvement. And rather than have it be like this awkward conversation around like, okay, you're asking me to do a bunch of work, yet you don't come to my event or you don't come to our events, you don't compensate for us for our work. Um, and, and it really creates created a lopsided dynamic in some other ERGs that we heard about. But within ours, when we had it start from this idea that, you know, people will consult and there's compensation, honestly, it just was really fun and enjoyable for the whole community. Um, and so uh, the other thing to, though that I, when I think about compensation is that, uh, or celebration, is there's a lot of really important career development that's going in or going on with our chairs. And so at 3Q Depth, one of the things that we do is at the end of the year review, the ERG success team writes reviews for all of our chairs and uh, really showcases all the incredible work that they've done. So talk about them as project managers, talk to them about leaders within their community, talk about um, you know, the relationships and culture building that they do. And so it's not just about the compensation, but also about like that push that we can give them in their career Career. And, and so I think that's just as important. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that's just so true. Like if you're a company that thinks, okay, well, I don't think we're going to be able to give compensation to our ERG leads right away in either stock options or in, you know, just cash, you know, a lot of ERG leads are people. And I was this, I started my career as a software engineer um, that want to make career changes. And if they're not people who want to make career changes, they're people who are gaining skills in the role as an ERG lead that makes them deserve a promotion, you know, in that work. So you want to give them opportunities to be internally mobile to, um, you know, something that we did was all of our executive sponsors who are major business leaders talked to the ERG leads managers on their teams and said, hey, this person's doing fantastic work. And that would, you know, impact their performance review at the end of the year. So whether it's horizontal or, in, or vertical mobility within an organization, the recognition that ERG leads receive should definitely include that component as well. Um, or, you know, honestly, like if that's where you need to start that's where you need to start and that's an incredibly valuable way to recognize people because that is compensation in its way if you get a promotion you're being compensated for your work you know absolutely i think that's a good shout out to our erg leaders especially at organizations that may not be getting compensated right now of course yes be loud be tenacious keep asking for it, but also, you know, keep yourself that same brag book that we all think about in terms of our career and pay attention to the impacts that you and your ERG are having so that you can use that to continue to showcase the impact you are having on the organization and how you can use that moving forward. There were more questions in the chat as well around budgets with ERG events and how does your organization approach funding events, 
providing budgets to that, um, but, you know, for those events as well? How do you approach getting funding for those? Uh, you know, curious as to if any of the panelists have any insight on that as well and as part of that compensation conversation. Hi, MJ. Um, my organization allocates a budget. Um, I put it in the chat. It's twenty thousand dollars to all ERGs on an annual basis, um, and this is meant to create swag, right? Um, to to leverage whether that's you know we're out um, doing a military veteran event where we're uh, redoing you know doing a surprise makeover of um, a veteran's home, or and we're wearing T-shirts to kind of. Um, tout our organization and our ERG or, you know, other volunteer events or pride events or things like that. So the swag is important. Um, I, we, it's a mortgage organization, so I have outward facing sales individuals as well. So it's good for um, <clears throat> communicating that inclusivity and giving them tools um, for, for our borrower base as well. Um, so the budget can be used for a number of things. Um, at one point in time, I think some of the ERGs were leveraging it for um, donations um, to community, um, you know, nonprofits. But um, our organization actually has a program around that now, and so they've decreased our budgets annually by five thousand dollars and have repurposed that into those um, in, into that that network that they're that they've created. Um, but the twenty thousand also we we um, Pride specifically, we do swag. We do outside services of therapy, like Paradox Therapy. If anybody you know, is a is a resource that we leverage out of Washington, and they come in and do speaking and training events. And so they've done several things around um, the mental health and uh, gender definitions and transgender awareness and all sorts of different um, motives for us. Um, that we've, you know, the HRC um, donation that we make or sponsorship that we do and and participate participation that we have. So that budget is meant uh, to be used for anything, you know, the, the rule of thumb is what is, what do our employees get out of the use of that money? And that's really, if, if we can figure that out and there's something substantial that I can put behind that and a business justification I can provide to it, then it's a good reason to use that money, right? So uh, that's what that, that money is pro provided to the ERGs uh, to help with. Yeah. Absolutely, that's really helpful. It's uh, finding a direct budget, and if you're lucky enough that your organization is, or if your organization is insightful enough to provide that direct budget for the ERG, is, is having a combination of allowing the ERG to decide and determine how to use that, but with some nice guidelines around, okay, how are we going to utilize this in a way that is super beneficial, that is gonna be useful, and that leans into the values, the things that our organization cares about. Um, shifting the conversation a little bit, Stephanie, I want to stick on you for a minute. Um, you did have a acquisition in your organization recently. I want to hear a little bit more about how did you approach, you know, relaunching a pride and relaunching your ERG after that acquisition? Um, I will tell you, it was extremely challenging to even fathom at the point that it occurred. We just, I, you know, personally, I just, launched earlier in that same year the ERG for my organization um, and we, we met the milestone of having the largest population of members um, that were involved you know that were involved in in the pride ERG and then all of a sudden we um, were acquired by another company who also had an ERG and to be honest what at first I was quite exhausted at the thought of really redoing all of that work all over again. Um, but at the end of the day, it ended, it ended up creating a much better ERG and a much better product um, than we had initially because it, it, it drew together strengths from both organizations. Um, it drew together additional diversity within the board. Um, and so, you know, we went back through all of it. They had, we had a name, they had a name. Well, what do we do with those two names and how do we do it in a way that everybody feels um, like they contributed to this and their name, um, their pride organization was, or excuse me, their LGBTQ ERG was uh, Open Doors. Uh, ours was pride and it's an acronym for a lot of words. Um, and so we ended up sticking with pride and that was a collective vote. Um, but we created a motto out of the open doors, which is open minds leads to open doors. And it actually, you know, again, just created something else that we could talk about because um, that's the, that's what we demand of our organization is that um, you don't necessarily have to agree with everything that we have to offer, but you need to respect us. And we, in order to respect us, you have to have an open mind to things. Um, so it, it really played well into that. And, and we went through um, the charter and aligned some things and, and said, you know, one of us 
was a little bit further along in rigor and organization. And so that was really helpful. And the other one was a lot more gung ho and had some, you know, some people that had additional bandwidth to contribute to this at a, um, at, to help us regain momentum. And I think at the end of the day, it worked out really well. And we've um, had our first three events. We try and do a monthly event. Um, we call some of them Sip and Speaks. And it's just a, it's meant to be more of a, you know, lunch and learn type of, you know, play on, on that uh, without telling anybody to bring a happy hour drink uh, or adult beverage to it. So um, we, we have our Sip and Speaks. And we've had two, um, two of those so far and then the Pride Celebration. And, and we, you know, hopefully, um, there's a lot of there's a lot of talk in the organization now on on multiple company fronts um, about what our ERG is doing and, and I think it really has just helped um, it just reinvigorate the ERGs in general. That's great. A good relaunch, a good re-strategy can go a really long way, uh, whether you're in an acquisition or you start to feel things are getting a little stale, you need a little bit more of that membership or excitement. Um, another really key feature that I do want to make sure that we touch on while we're in here and we've touched on a little bit in some of our conversations is this idea of senior leaders and executives being involved in ERGs. So, you know, it's what role do senior leaders and executives have in supporting your ERG? You know, what successes have you seen from that? Uh, Gwen, I want to pass that to you first. Well, oh, that is a great question because I think it, it's a really important topic. Leadership absolutely sets the tone for the entire company. Uh, they, they dictate the culture. They dictate the buy-in. It, you know, I hate to say it, but if the, the CEO it just isn't interested in, DEI work, a lot of people aren't going to be interested. But if they're active and they're participatory, then it's going to breed a culture of participation along with it. Uh, and I've, I've seen that, you know, specifically at Chime, we have very, very active executives who really, you know, they're passionate about the communities they're part of. And because of that, they get involved in those communities. And, and that really leads to people likewise getting involved. Uh, so, you know, I see executive buy in, leadership buy in is really fundamental to driving a lot of our core purpose of our core activities um, and just generally creating a, a welcoming culture for these things and even if they're not part of the community like having that buy-in you know creates the, the ability for allies who are not part of that community to buy in so uh, culture is absolutely set top down and you, you need to be <laughs> chipping away at those executives to get them to come to the events and get them to, to participate however you can Absolutely. No, definitely. Very, very true. I want to pass that same question to you, Anne, as well. What role do you see these senior leaders and executives have in supporting ERGs? Yeah, I mean, I think Gwen is head on with this. I mean, you know, senior leaders allocate resources and time, and those are the things that you need in order to have these structures in place. You know, like Gwen said, they set the culture of an organization. They can act as ambassadors for this work and they can participate in themselves. Um, and they also drive accountability. I think that's one of the biggest things to do. Um, you know, when it comes down, they can set expectations for their leaders. They can, this can be part of their performance review processes. You know, you can tie your senior leaders you know, performance reviews to this kind of work. And when that happens, they become much more accountable to participate. And um, yeah, I honestly don't have that much to add other than what Gwen said, but they're critically important. And um, they're the ones who really at the end of the day have a say whether systems and processes change. So, and that's a lot of the work that we're doing. If it's benefits, if it's, you know, a change in the product, you know, they have the say at the end of the day. Absolutely. Okay, uh, with 10 minutes less left as a final question to each one of the panelists here, what is one insight or call to action that you would like to make sure we leave the audience with today? Um, Greg, let's start with you. Yeah, uh, definitely want to push the idea that diversity and inclusion work is work and people who do work in an organization should be compensated for the work that they do. And that's generally the philosophy that we have at 3Q. So whether it's you know our ERG chairs, they're doing work for the organization, why would that be treated any differently than anything else anybody does? We also have expectations that speakers don't come and speak for free. Either we compensate them for their time or we make a donation on their behalf. Um, and so once you get in the mindset that 
DEI work is no different than any other kind of work uh, within the organization. It, it sets, I think, a healthier tone and expectation around how people participate. Um, and also one thing I remembered, one key thing that we've talked about uh, internally to help push the, the agenda of creating compensation for chairs um, is that also chairs typically develop a lot of leadership skills. And if they leave our organization to go to another organization that compensates their chairs, then we're for you know what is not all that much money, we might be losing future leaders of our organizations. And then one other tiny thing I wanted to throw in there too, is that uh, try to get out of a month to like having the ERGs live on a month to month sort of basis. If they can create content calendars ahead of time and really feel prepared, uh, the events feel a lot more professional, a lot more well organized, and that you know pays itself back in terms of how members you know feel like uh, whether or not they're getting a lot of value out of what they're attending. So two things there, but yeah, the main things I'm thinking about. I love it. We'll let you sneak that one in. Yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, Gwen, what's what's an insight or call to action that you'd like to like to leave the audience with today? Uh, for me, it would just be, you know, build your networks, leverage your allies, find your champions. They're they're going to be huge in, in uh, instituting whatever you want. Like the community is going to be great, but there's always going to be the need for external buy-in on a lot of these things. So get those allies, make sure you include them and be sure not to, to be mean to them if they do things slightly wrong. <laughs> Absolutely. Don't provide a little grace. I, I think if I've learned anything from some of your other answers today, Gwen, as well, it is keep asking, yeah, um, be, be a little tenacious and, uh, and and you'll get a little bit further. Uh, I love that. Uh, Stephanie, what's, what's your insider call to action that you'd like to leave the audience with today? Um, I would say just be open um, because there's a there's a lot as Greg said there's a lot to this LGBTQ plus community um, and you know I identify with one of those letters not all of those letters um, and therefore I have a ton to learn um, and while I may may be the loudest and most vocal um, that only provides me with the responsibility of making sure that I am giving the right voice to those who need that um, and in a lot of instances, the L's and the G's don't need it as much as the B's and the T's and some of the other letters. And so be aware of that as well. Um, and just make sure that your ERG um, benefits the entire alphabet, not just a couple of the easy letters, right? Um, and, and that, so that, that would be my advice. I've learned a ton in this. And as it turns out, I have, you know, a child, a, a six-year-old who's um, started, you know, asking for, he's born male and, you know, wearing, wanting to wear dresses to school and grow his hair out to have an Elsa braid and uh, wants to wear, you know, the bows and all of those things. And um, as a parent, this ERG has provided me with a ton of information to make sure that I'm not just open to what he needs, but able to navigate that and support him in the best ways possible. So that's all I would say is just be open and learn and use your voice appropriately. I love that. Absolutely. Be open. We're often only one of the letters and there's a whole alphabet there that we want to be uh, open to as well. Um, and what what would you like to leave the audience with today? Yeah, there are kind of two things. I think Stephanie was kind of getting into this. But the humil I think humility is incredibly important and a dedication to continue continuous learning. Um, as someone who uses pronouns that not everyone, you, not a lot of people use, you know, I'm used to people messing them up. And I also don't mind if someone messes them up as long as they are open to continuous learning, as long as they are kind and respectful to me and truly want to refer to me as I want to be referred to. And I think there's a lot of humility that comes, that comes into being a great leader in this work, especially if you're from HR and not a member of the community and don't have the context you need. The second thing is if you're in HR or an employee experience or something right now, like I was saying before, employee resource group leaders um, have a role in your organization like any other employee in your organization. You need to define something like, the, like for them, like a job description. You need to define their roles and responsibilities because the biggest conflicts I've seen for employee resource group leadership is that one, they're not recognized or compensated properly. And two, they're 
given a lot of responsibility and then a lot of it gets taken away because the organization grows or changes and other organizations want to take over their work. So define that now, even if you already have the ERGs, if you don't, that's great, define it now. If you do, still define it now, make that racy, define those responsibilities, work with your current ERG leaders to establish what those responsibilities are. Um, and I think you'll have a much better time at actually getting them to do the things that you really want them to do. Absolutely. It's so, so important to have all of these things and be considering all of these things. Wow, what a an amazing conversation. I know that there were a lot of questions in the chat that we didn't quite get to. Uh, it's a really, really good set of questions, good set of participants. Uh, thank you everyone for joining our webinar about how, to, how and when to start these resource groups for LGBTQIA plus individuals and allies. If you do have any questions for myself or the panelists, please feel free to reach out to all of us on LinkedIn. And if you have any questions about All Voices, reach out to myself or anybody else on the All Voices team. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, panelists. I appreciate all of you. Thanks, MJ. Thanks. Thank you. Happy Pride. Happy Pride.